you there. It is the new year. Um, I'm going to give you a second so that we can pop on. For once, I was actually like spot on at the time I was meant to get started. You may notice I'm all woollied up. It's um, I'm pretty cold. It is. I should really have a little bit more heating on here, but that is. In the summertime, this is glorious. It's all windows, double height ceiling, and it's a lovely space to be in. In winter, if you've got sunshine, it's perfect. Right now outside the window, it's pouring rain. It is not that cold, but the dampness makes it really, really, really cold feeling. So it's kind of getting into my bones. Um, but it gives me a chance to wear my new, <laughs> my new Hawthorne Blaster. It's really, really cozy. I'm very comfy. And I knit myself a pair, a new pair of fingerless mitts. This was my Christmas present to myself coming back into the office because I realized that my hands get really cold. And obviously I need to be able to type. So wearing fingerless mittens has been a bit of a revelation for me. I um, know it sounds silly, but it never really occurred to me to wear mitts inside when I'm doing other things because to my mind I'm like okay gloves and mittens that's what you wear outside but it really helps if your hands get cold um, and in my case I don't have I think I don't have very good circulation so it gets quite achy and stiff um, when my hands are cold so putting on a pair of mitts makes a big difference. Hey River you knitting? I was just talking about my Christmas present to myself knitting a pair of mitts this is, it's not a pattern, it's just, I just did a tube of one by one ribbing, stockinette stitch increases for the fingers, and then I made them nice and long so that it can either be folded down like, or can be straightened out like this if you're outside and you want a longer one, or folded back like this. So very, very straightforward that I just, I wanted to knit it during the holidays, but not really think about it too much. So with the result that, I just kind of figured out the amount of stitches I wanted for this and then just winged it from that point on. But it's it, there's not much to it. Just picked the weight of the yarn was the main thing. Um, but I do find it's the first time I've done ones which have got a fold back edge like this and it is quite handy. It's it's almost like having an extension of your sleeve. You know the way you've seen sleeves that come down here and they've actually got an, an opening for the finger. It's the same kind of thing. The fingerless mitts that you can fold down and fold back are really almost like having um, just really long sleeves that you've got the thumb hole openings in. Hi Liz, how are you? How was everyone's Christmas? I feel like I haven't seen any of you or talked to you since we've, uh, since we've been back. We came back a little earlier than some other places. We were back on Tuesday and we started slowly. We were officially open on Wednesday, but we were in here on Tuesday to just slowly get back into the rhythm of it. Um, so let me know in the comments how your Christmas was. I know Liz, you gave some beautiful hats to your family. The photograph that you shared on Facebook was just lovely, where you've got the full range of different hats that, with them all wearing it. It was beautiful, really, really lovely. Um, I didn't give, I, oh, the, I had the one pair, one knitted pair of gloves for my son, but that was before Christmas because I wanted to get it knit before the um, cold weather finished because his hands were frozen and him of the giant hands, he needed those extra long fingers. So that one did get finished. Um, but yeah, let me know whatever else you've knit for your, for your families, what your Christmas was like. Um, for us, we had my family, my sister and her family all came over from Holland for the week. And between Christmas and when they left, just before New Year's, it was on Thursday they left. All we did was sit around and play games, played board games or um, Jackbox, if anyone has done that. It's very good when you've got a very large group. It's just all in your phones, but with the TV. Um, it's a very good idea to fold the fingerless gloves. I can't. Um, take credit for it. It's something that I've seen um, done quite a bit and I hadn't really done it myself before but it is particularly handy because if you're typing you do want them folded back so but it, for it to be able to fold down you actually need it a little longer than you think and it looks somewhat strange when you're knitting it because it looks like it's just a little bit longer than it's supposed to be but it does mean that when you fold them down it gives a nice neat fold. Um, 
Liz, thanks, they love them. And you just finished a toddler jumper. Ah, very good. Uh, I love doing children's sweaters. They're so fast and you can do, I, particularly I like the colors, that they like mad colors so that you can do some really fun colors with them. My favorite was always actually stripes. I was a big fan of stripes, loved it. Um, but yeah, so the week was lovely and relaxing. Um, we ate too much. We didn't move, but it was it was really good. But we're very slow to get started here again. I don't know if anyone is having a hard time getting restarted or maybe you've actually decided to just take the rest of the week off. I know that some people have done that and are not going back until next week. But it uh, kind of feels a little bit like an engine slowly trying to choke back into into action after it's been shut off for a while because it was a full shut off. Um, Babel, unfortunately, you had Corona very lightly. So you sat in your room knitting and finishing the Guggen cardigan before the season club starts. Uh, well, I am glad that it was a mild uh, version of it. But you thankfully had knitting because, I mean, poor non-knitters when they have to isolate. It's, uh, it gets a bit boring, I think. So it's we definitely have an advantage going there. Um, Liz, you played loads of board games as well. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a huge big thing. Lots and lots of board games. Biggest problem we had was that we had too many people. So we ended up having to switch to a lot of them being phone-wise and things like that because we just couldn't fit everyone around the table unless they did went into teams Chantal you made a baby layette for your grandnephew oh lovely really nice um, yeah I do I need to get some more baby and toddler knits on my needles it's easy to tell that my kids and my nieces and nephews aren't very small anymore because of the fact that I haven't really made any baby or children knits for for a few years in fact so Let's get a few on. Find a few babies to, to dress, perhaps. There's always some around. But I wanted to tell you today as well about the sweater I'm wearing. Does anyone recognize it? You may perhaps recognize my new cozy sweater. This is... I'm going to wait for a second to see if anyone pops up and can recognize it. I suspect a few of you do. Um, it is done in Blosta yarn. So Blosta, it's milled in Ireland. It's 60% Irish fleece, 40% New Zealand. It's wool and spun. So it's very light and blooms really, really nicely when you, um, when you wash it. Hoth yeah, Liz got it. Hawthorn. It's the Hawthorne sweater. The original sweater was a new worsted, which is a very luxurious yarn. It's merino, yak and linen. It's worsted spun which means that it's got it's a more dense spin because there's no air in it. So it gives like a real smooth, slightly heavier textured um, fabric to it. But we have the, this particular yarn, the Blasta, knits up at a very similar gauge, but it's a totally different one because it's a woolen spun. When something's woolen spun and it traps all of that air in, it gives it a very, very light, bouncy feel to it. So I was really curious as to how the Hawthorne textured sweater would knit up and what it would be like. And the answer is it knits up really nicely and it is lovely to wear. So the, again, it's oversized. We've got the big slits down the side, front and back. The back shoulder detail is one of my favorite. You can see how the decreases are worked up along there on both sides and then it's seamed front and back. And then the sleeve sizes are generously sized. So it, you can see there's a good bit of room in the top and then it comes down to fit at the bottom. It's got a textured uh, sand stitch here and a mistake rib at the bottom. So let me just hold that up so you can kind of see how woolly and fluffy it is. You can still see the texture, but it looks quite different from the Blasta. I've actually, I'll pull the Blasta up over here. I've got a pile of yarn that I don't want to knock down here. <laughs> I did that already to knock down. So this is the Blaster version and this is the other one. So you can see this one, it's kind of got, I wish I could show you what these feel like when you see them. Let's see if I could show you. It's kind of got a density to it so that it's got, it, it's a little heavier and I mean, it's still warm. Both feel lovely. This one is kind of got a slightly lighter, a bouncier feel to it. But again, because it's textured and it's oversized, it does, play really nicely into it. So we've actually just, just today, in fact, before I, before I came on live here, 
I put Blaster kits up on the website as well. Blaster yarn, because it comes in 100 grams rather than 50 grams, it ends up becoming a lot more cost effective because the price per skein is a little less and it's 100 rather than the 50. So the kits are going to be much, much more cost effective. So if you found the Hawthorne kits were on the higher end of the price spectrum, but you like the sweater, come take a look at the Blaster ones because we had a restock of Blasta in December. So we have all of the colors. So we've got a huge range of colors up there that you can try it out in. We've also added in the bottom there. When you get the yarn kit, it comes with the yarn and it comes with the project bag, but it doesn't come with the pattern or workshop. But those are underneath. You'll see add-ons. You can add either the pattern or the workshop. And if you pop the workshop in, it comes with the pattern. So yeah, that way, if you've perhaps joined the knit along already and you already have the pattern, you can just get the yarn kit and you're not buying the pattern multiple times for no reason. That's why we've had questions before about that, but that's a big part of it is sometimes people like to knit patterns more than once. And if I bundle the whole thing always together, it means that every time you buy a new yarn kit, you're getting a new pattern that you no longer need. So this way you can put in just what you need as you're going through. And also you may prefer to have the video workshop. You can put that in, or if you just want the pattern, you can add that in as well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways of doing it. And hopefully by having it all on the one page together, which we've been working towards for the last couple of years, and we've eventually found a way of doing it, which I think works pretty well and is fairly seamless. So very happy about that. But let me pick up some of the blaster colors here. I've dropped a few. Um, this one, Nadur, is one that has been out of stock for quite a while and it has in fact been flying off the shelf since it came back in. But you can see it is a natural, a fairly natural creamy colour, but there are a few little slightly darker flecks into it. But that one is Nadur, so that is one of the options. What I'm wearing here is the grey one, or Leah, and that is our Leah here. Leah is Irish for grey. If you want something a little brighter or a little darker, there's a few options here. We've got our ghoul, Irish for coal here. Lovely charcoal, dark, dark gray. Not quite black, it's really a charcoal gray. You can see there's little flecks of color in there still. So definitely not a black. This is ore, Irish for gold. So it's a lovely um, mustardy color. So like these would be kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, very dark, much brighter, but they both do make a very nice option. There's a few, oh, sorry, I'm gonna drop down here. We've also got a bunch of marls that look really nicely. I, I quite like this. This is our Leah and the Ghoul. So the two ones you were looking at, the dark and the gray, when they're marled in together, this is what they look like. This is, I did a, swish, a sweater, swisher, sweater for this last year. Um, and this one is the uh, Quilta Ore, but Durkla last year I knit into this. And you, when you see it like this, it looks kind of stripy. But when you knit textured patterns up in a marled yarn, it looks, it really does look very interesting because the texture bounces up and down and those colors all blend in together. So it looks very, very different than what you see on this here. So if you want to know what this looks like, the best way to have a look is just pop into the website and look for Durkula and you'll see it knitted up. And that's also got like a lot of texture and it's got um, like the blackberry stitch and a few other texture stitches on it. But it'll give you an idea of what the marls look a little bit like. This one is a burgundy and Leah and the burgundy by itself is over here. So it's a, well, it does what it says in the tin. It's a burgundy color. <laughs> Um, but it's a very another very popular one actually lovely color um, this is one we got in last year and i actually really like the color it's called duok it is a blue it's i don't know if you call it not quite a royal blue maybe a royal blue navy little lighter than navy blue royal blue probably is the best color name for it but really pretty blue duok and some of the other ones this is also a new one last year and it is very complex color there. This is Farragut, which is the name in Irish for sea, where you've got greens and blues and purples. 
even little bits of kind of mustardy in there. It is just loads and loads of different colors in the Farragher. And this is also a very popular one all the time. This is spare, so light blue color here. I think that's probably most of them. There's a couple of other uh, marls over there, but I think you've seen all of the individual colors at this point kind of popping up. But this, yes, if you want to find a kit for this, hop onto the website, you will find Hawthorne Blasta kit with the patterns or workshop options in the bottom. And it's up there and it's live now. And all kits come with project bag and 5% off um, the, the bundle of it all together. Um, but if you've got any other questions, just make sure if you've got any other questions down there, just pop them up, whether it's about this or whether it's about anything else that might be happening. Um, we are trying to, I know we're, we're operating slowly because slowly moving into the new year, but we are getting ourselves moving to get a few new things out the door. So next week we will have something new coming that I'm not going to talk about yet, but make sure you do not miss our live next week because we're going to have a brand new launch and it's one that's been much anticipated. So it will be a lot of fun. The other thing we've been talking about, if you've been watching my profile and looking through, we're having a little bit of a discussion uh, about brioche and different tips and different techniques for brioche. To, I think I'm actually going to probably next week put together a vlog talking a little bit about brioche, the different types of stitches you can do. And it is it never ceases to amaze me. It is a topic that is very divisive. It seems to be people either love it or hate it. But there have been a few times where I've come across people where, a bit like with short rows, it's been called out in the pattern, but it's not named. They say, just do this. And they just come along and quite happily knit along through the actual, uh, the technique itself. And then after the fact, they're like, that's actually not that big a deal. So I, I suspect that it's not a big deal for everyone, but sometimes when things are named and it's anticipated that it's going to be difficult, that it builds up a lot of apprehension in people's heads. But like with most things, I actually usually suggest starting, starting at the beginning, but starting with the simplest version of it, which is often one color back and forth in rows, just to get into the rhythm of it, see what the terminology looks like because it's slightly different. And then bizarrely, the next easiest one is actually to move to working in the round and doing two colors because every color has the same round and you're just alternating as you go up. So it's it's color coded. Each one makes total sense. And the one that is probably the most complicated is flat with two colors because you're working each side twice, once with each color. So you slip them back to the start and it takes a little it, it's that one is a bit easier when you start to recognize the brioche stitches, which side the colors of the yarn is on, are on. So I actually think that's kind of probably I'd put that third step wise in terms of difficulty. Um, Chantelle, you were asking, what would be a good first sweater? Good first sweater. I've got a couple of ones that I often suggest for starting off with. If you're completely new to sweaters, then I've got a Brack, B-R-E-A-C sweater, which is a top down raglan with um, yarn over increases. So it's very straightforward. I've taken some of the complexities that I sometimes have for different patterns out of it and just kept it very straightforward and very simple. So that one is would be kind of an absolute. I have not knit sweaters top down before. I do always do top down seamless. Um, that's partially because I don't really like doing seams, but I do think that it gives you the option of trying it on as you're going. And so if you're unused to sizing sweaters, it means that you're much more likely to come out with something that you're happy with because the biggest mess up I ever made with a sweater was one of my first ones where I did it in pieces. My gauge changed as I was working through it and I wasn't checking. And by the time I was finished, it was too late. So when you're getting used to it, like I'm, I have nothing against pieced sweaters that are sewn together, but you have to be a lot more careful with your gauge and with your sizing as you're going through with them because you're not che you don't have the option of checking it on as you're going. But yeah, so top down leaves you checking on. Brack is going to be the best, uh, the best option for that. The other one that I have that I think actually makes a pretty nice um, 
first sweater as well is Dakite, D-A-C-I-T-E, and that one is top down. It's also a sweater. It's mainly stock and S stitch, and the front panels are in garter stitch. Um, and it is it's top down, but there's a few more techniques going on it. But if you've done a bit more knitting, the techniques probably will be very manageable. Um, but both of those make really nice first sweaters. If you want workshops to go with them, they've both got workshops. Um, if you're happy with just the pattern, then there's also standalone patterns. So either of those should work pretty well. Um, Liz, you'd say it is, but get the workshop. You made it and it was quite, oh, sorry, where are we? Liz, I am not sure which one, what you're, you're talking to there. You said um, pen and paper. Oh, you're talking about brioche. Um, pen and paper help you keep track of the pattern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, writing things down. Um, uh, Chantal, you, lo you really love the one I'm wearing today. Um, oh, thank you. Um, uh, this one is not too straightforward. The shoulder construction is a little bit different, but if you're newer to it, the, it's quite forgiving because of the fact that it is oversized. So you're not really worried about sizing to the same extent because you can see there's a good bit of, let me hold it out, there's a good bit of positive ease. It's bigger than my body style, but I actually think that the split hem gives you a little bit more flow as you're going along with it so that it gives you the option of being able to have it oversized without feeling floppy is probably the best way to put it. Um, but for new, the workshop probably will make a big difference because you've got, you can check your way through each section of it so that if you get stuck, you've got something to refer to. Um, it is bottom up rather than top down, um, but just keep measuring as you're going through. Um, so again, lost track of myself. I was talking about first sweaters. I know what I've been talking about. It was brioche knitting and I was just talking about the different types, one color, two color in the round and two color knitted flat. But some of the tips that were coming up that were really helpful is everyone, like almost everyone talked about lifelines. And I had somebody pop up today um, in the feed was asking what a lifeline was. So if you haven't come across a lifeline before, it can be a lifesaver <laughs> in your knitting, knitting lifesaver. I cannot lay any claims to lifelines for anything other than knitting related. But when, what you want to do is if you've got something where there's a pattern repeat and you complete one section of a pattern, you know it's correct. If you put a lifeline in and then you knit on and you mess up, you can pull your needle out, rip it right back and it'll come back down to the lifeline with all of those stitches sitting on the lifeline. You know exactly where it is and you don't have to. It just takes it's much, much faster because you're not picking up each individual stitch and it's just sitting on the needles. So what you're all you're doing with the lifeline is you're taking very fine thread. Sometimes people use waxed, um, uh, oh, sorry, unwaxed dental floss, very fine embroidery thread or a smooth, fine cotton yarns, anything like that that's strong and it's fine is going to be good. Thread it onto a, a, a darning needle and run it through the stitches that are on your needle. You just so that you've just got a thread sitting there and you can actually even do this a few times up. I had somebody talk about how they'll have two at a time and then when they come to the third one, they'll take the lower one out. So they'll always have one in place when they're putting on the next one. And sometimes people will do it for each pattern repeat. If it's brioche, you might do it just every few inches so that if you're worried about um, something kind of getting messed up, you can come back down to it. So it, it's really, really helpful mainly because of the fact that the trickiest part about brioche is fixing mistakes. Like it is possible, but it is much more difficult to fix mistakes in brioche because you've got multiple layers and strands going on. So if you've got the ability to rip back down without being a big deal, it makes it much easier. Um, and the other huge thing with brioche is because you're only doing half of the stitches in every row or every round, it takes twice as long to make uh, to make the vertical distance. So it does slow your knitting down um, is, is the whole thing. But it, what the nice thing is it creates such a thick, squishy fabric. It's very, very, um, it's very, very squishy. Um, Liz, can any brioche pattern be knit in two colors? Um, most of them can be. You kind of have to, if there's something that's knit in one color that you transfer to two colors, 
the kind of things that you need to just be careful of is where you've got decreases to make sure the single color line goes through but for the most part yeah it's it is pretty possible um a little bit easier like i said with things in the round but there's there shouldn't be any reason why you couldn't convert any one to two colors i think i missed another question if you wants to know if she can make the hawthorn as a first yes i spotted that you could um, but um, with workshops is the answer i think um but if you've got any other knitting tips for brioche pop them up here because it does scare so many people but when people love it they really love it so if there's things that make it easier for you let me know so i can pass them on to other knitters and we can spread the brioche love basically and it was something that i hadn't it was i missed the initial brioche interest you know a couple of years ago there was a huge surge in brioche and at the time i hadn't really knit brioche or i hadn't really focused on it and it was a couple of years afterwards that i came to brioche and i'm like oh i actually really like that um because it it just um it just likes i like the fabric of it but the length of time it takes and some of the other bits and pieces, the fact that it's spread so much so that you have to make sure that you drop a needle size down and you take account for the stretch if you're doing something like a garment or something that you don't want to stretch out of shape. Um, you like the little holes in your changeable needles, they work great. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's something I should have said as well. When we're doing lifelines, interchangeable needles have a hole. Oh, I don't think I've got one over there. Um, they have a little hole in the top of the cord where the cord goes. You can actually thread the thread in, either holding it in there or I've seen people just will tape it down. And then when you're knitting that row or working that row, you're actually pulling the lifeline through. You untape it at the end and you don't have to go messing with using, using a needle to thread it through. And it works really, really well because as so many people are using interchangeable needles. So the little hole which is meant for tightening it up can have a second use so don't you love it when things can be used in two different ways and we have a recommendation here do not drink during brioche yes i would agree with that and do not fix things late at night with brioche and do not knit brioche that is complicated or doing decreases or increases in bad light because you won't be able to see what you're doing so yeah all of these things are true it kind of anything that would apply for something like for instance lace knitting i think you can apply to brioche and the reason we do it is it's so pretty like i mean that's that's basically why we knit something like brioche because the fabric feels really nice and it's a beautiful stitch it just it's like holding cotton wool because it's got so much bounce and uh, yeah i'm in a bit of a brioche kick at the moment i think i'm definitely mentally swinging into the brioche frame of mind um, but if you've got any more comments on that just pop them up because i'm going to save this after i finished the live here and you can pop the comments up and um that way everybody can can see them as they come along but if anything comes to you later just come in and share it i think that's probably it for me today i'm gonna go get myself a nice warm cup of tea what I really want is a coffee, but it's too late in the evening here for a coffee. I'll be bouncing off the ceiling for the rest of the evening if I have a coffee. Um, so it's going to be a tea. I'll be sensible. Um, and I'll do a few jumping jacks to keep myself warm before I sit down at the computer again. But thank you for joining me. And do come back next week, this time 2.30 Irish time on next Thursday. And I'm going to have a brand new release for you. So see you then.